We aimed towards a gap between low hills which I believed led to Uteborg, where the Twelfth Army should be. The distance from the burned ground to that gap was barely a kilometre, but the ground was uneven, and the panther could only proceed at walking pace, with the column stumbling in our wake. We crossed a hundred metres, with the panther juddering as if it was about to explode, then another hundred, and by now the survivors of our column were breaking into a hobbling, frantic run, drawing on their last reserves of energy and hope to make this final dash. I saw a group of houses ahead, which I thought might be the outskirts of Uteborg. Artillery began to fall on us, heavy calibre field guns which lifted great chunks out of the ground and scattered them into dust. These explosions fell to our right, with debris cutting down a few of our people on that side as they ran. Then the red gunners recalibrated, and the shells fell across our front, making a curtain of explosions that we would have to run through. I dropped down into the turret, hearing the smash of shrapnel and stones against the armour plate. One shell landed close to us, and the pressure wave made the whole panther flatten and then bounce up as it passed over us. The shock wave moved through the panzer, making blood spurt from my nose and leaving my ears ringing. I realised that the engine had died, and I could dimly hear the driver trying to start it. I decided that the panther was probably finished, and told the crew to exit and find shelter before the whole vehicle was turned over by an explosion. We stumbled out of the panzer and threw ourselves onto the ground near the houses. Our column was already taking shelter there. The shattered windows and doors revealed huddled groups with their hands over their heads. I glimpsed a group of Soviet infantries too, on the edge of the houses, also seeking cover, caught in the open by their own bombardment. I saw a house with a basement window at ground level, its shutters hanging open, and I jumped in there. Ducking down into the basement, I found that it was occupied by several small children, girls of six or seven years, and two women. The women had the children huddled to them, and their faces were clenched in fear. The explosions outside made the whole floor lift up, and pieces of masonry were starting to fall from the walls. As bricks fell loose among us, a pair of boots appeared at the foot of the steps, and a man crashed into the refuge, followed by another man. They crouched on the floor, staring at us. They were Russians. They were young, barely twenty, and they wore thin tunics, backpacks and steel helmets. The red star on their chest pockets glowed bright in the light from the stairs. Each man was holding a cylinder drum machine pistol. They looked at me, at the children and women, and then at the flashes of explosions at the top of the stairs. Then they just shrugged and sat back against the opposite wall their guns in their hands, not taking their eyes off us. I could feel the weight of my pistol in my holster. The reds showed no sign of violence, despite my uniform. One of them grinned at the children and winked, making explosion noises in his throat. A shell burst outside made dust pour from the ceiling. The children flinched and whimpered. This cheerful Russian reached into his pocket and showed the children a picture of his family. The children looked at it in silence. Then they looked at me expectantly. Keen to reassure them, I fumbled out the photo of the unknown young woman in my pocket and showed it to them. Everybody nodded in approval, the children, the women, and the two Russian lads. Debris was still falling onto us from the explosions. One of the soldiers took his steel helmet off, reached it out and placed it on the head of one little girl, saying something in Russian. The girl's head was almost concealed by the green steel helmet. The man leaned back, bareheaded. There was a shell burst directly in the doorway at the top of the stairs, and debris flew down the steps onto us all. I ducked, covering my head, and threw myself in front of the children. I heard shrapnel smashing down the stairs and hitting the walls around us. I looked up. The bareheaded Russian man had been hit in the forehead, where his helmet would have protected him. A long piece of shrapnel projected from the wound. He looked dead. His friend was checking his pulse, feeling for signs of life, and then muttering angrily. His eyes burning, he stared at the child with the green helmet and reached for his gun. I shot him twice in the chest, then leaned across and shot him again in the head, 
while the children screamed. The bodies lay there in front of us while the shelling went on. When there appeared to be a lull in the bombardment, I told the women to come with me, to leave that place and join our journey to the west. They refused, preferring to stay in their cellar, whatever the outcome. To save them from more trouble than they already faced, I called to my crewmen and we pulled the Russian bodies out of the cellar and left them in a crater some distance away from the houses. The foot column was slowly reassembling from the shattered buildings, with people emerging in ones and twos. After several attempts, my crew started the panther again, and we formed up our column and then moved on towards the gap in the hills. The next troops that we saw were German, and they called to us to keep moving, that the 12th Army was directly ahead. These troops were guarding an 80 Fimi emitter gun and a pair of Hetzer destroyers, which were dug in to guard the hills, so we believed that they were not defectors. We began to find more troops, dug into foxholes or manning gun emplacements, who told us that the 12th Army Corridor was still open for us. With the Panther at walking speed, our ragged, bleeding convoy moved into the corridor itself, and we began to move on towards the west. The corridor was barely three kilometres wide, and on each side there were towers of smoke and constant gunfire, as the German 12th Army screens there tried to hold off the Soviet pincers that were seeking to crush the safety zone. Red planes raced overhead, but there was a strong flak cover here, with 20 mitoliter flak wagons using plentiful ammunition. We saw a Sturmovik shot down, with its wings crumpling as it twisted around on fire and slammed into one of the hills beside us. The centre of this corridor was full of targets for the Red Jabos, Columns of troops that had made it through the encirclements and the pockets to the east, single panzers such as ours, and a few groups of armour, many horses and handcarts for the civilians. The few farmhouses in this region were burning fiercely, many with improvised cemeteries in their yards instead of vegetable gardens and animal paddocks. One yard contained a T-34 upside down in a crater, and another had a complete Stuka Panzerbuster aircraft just sitting in its grazing meadow, with its canopy hanging open, surrounded by dead cattle with their hooves in the air. Everywhere were foot soldiers or civilians scavenging as they trudged west, beneath trees whose branches were blackened with incendiary fires. If some among us had imagined that the Twelfth Army Zone would be a place of safety, it became clear that the danger here was still very great. At one point the protective screen on our left seemed to give way, and German 12th Army infantry began streaming back into the centre zone, in full retreat, adding to the confusion around us. Officers halted them with shots over their heads, and several troops who had thrown their weapons away were shot dead out of hand. Still, the breach in the defences was there, barely a kilometre from us, and the sound of tanks came through between the shell bursts. From up in the cupola, I saw two of our Stug's MJ from concealment beside the road and hid towards the danger point. The crews of these Stugs were young teenagers, perhaps 16 years of age, and they must have known that they were going to their deaths. They went with blank faces, their eyes wide with amphetamines and fear. I traversed my panther and moved in support of them, and although my vehicle would now only operate in second gear, we travelled a few hundred metres through the trees and scrub between us and the screen of the corridor. We passed a staff car among the bushes, which contained two Wehrmacht majors, both middle-aged but fit and unwounded, both simply waiting in their fine car for the passage to be secured for them by the sacrifice of the young men. We clipped the car in passing, tearing off a wheel, and we moved to a firing position, from which we could just see the edge of the corridor itself. The situation out there was desperate. The two Stugs were firing on a phalanx of T-34s which were nosing in on a gap in the defences. An 80E Mitimiti Paiki gun was also firing from a bunker, and remnants of our infantry were crouched in slit trenches and craters, clutching panzerfausts. A group of Volkssturm men, aged in their fifties, marched past us rapidly, panzerfausts and carbines held ready to help fill the gap. These men were immediately hit by a shell burst, and their bodies were dismembered across the ground. A gang of Hiwis, the Russian collaborators who feared recapture by the Reds more than anything, ran forward and seized the dead men's guns. 
these Russian defectors threw themselves into the battle with the reckless courage of men whose death sentence was already passed. My gunner fired on the leading T-34, stopping it dead, and two German troops rushed forward with panzerfausts to finish it. The rockets tore off the front plate of the red panzer, while the red crew were still trying to scramble out of the hatches. The T-34 began to explode from inside, with main gun ammunition bursting out of the fractured hull in spirals of smoke and sparks. My panther was hit by the other T-34s, and a shell split the front edge of our turret so that I could see daylight between the wall and the roof. Another shell hit our front plate and bounced upward in a spray of debris. I told the gunner to fire all our remaining ammunition, and with those few remaining rounds, we hit another T-34, which was charging on our 80 Hiekit Minul position. We knocked the turret right off that panzer, but the hull kept rolling forward, lurching wildly, until it ploughed into the park emplacement and crushed the 88 Militoth crew under its tracks. On my orders, my panther began to reverse, with nothing by way of fuel or ammunition left to fight with, as the Stugs and their teenage crews fought on, firing again and again at the ranks of T-34s rolling in from the fields beyond. From somewhere, two fresh panthers came to join the defence, vehicles that seemed to be direct from the factory, in perfect paint and equipment fitted to the hulls. As we reversed away and moved back towards the central zone, we saw many of the Hiwi men, finishing their ammunition, stand up and walk towards the T-34s, deliberately exposing themselves to the deadly fire. For the Hiwis, it was better to die like that, quickly and anonymously, than spend the rest of their lives in the Gulag, knowing that, because of their collaboration, their families were sharing that fate too. The two infantry majors whose car we had just clipped tried to flag us down, demanding a ride, brandishing their pistols. I was not in the frame of mind to suffer these fools, and so I jumped down from the turret and disarmed them. We checked their car and found two full cans of gasoline in the back. Two full cans! That was enough for another thirty kilometres. The two officers scowled as we filled our tank, then offered us a box of gold watches if we would accept them as passengers. We took two Panzerfausts from some Volkssturm men rushing past us and armed the two majors with these, sending them up to the front line with kicks from our hobnail boots. The Volkssturm assured us that the officers would be a valuable resource, worth a whole platoon of panthers, and began driving them on with their carbines. The perimeters of the corridor were shrinking every minute. The red planes circled overhead, weaving between the flak, firing into the fleeing columns or unloading fragmentation bombs along our route. These bombs separated in the air into smaller containers of explosives, which scattered wildly over a huge area, exploding in torrents of ball bearings and shrapnel. I thought that I was immune to the sight of death and injury, but the sights we saw on that final few kilometres were astonishing. A civilian bus, commandeered by staff officers, was bogged down in a rut and hit by a fragmentation burst. The thin sides of the bus were ripped open, and the bodies of the officers inside tumbled out onto the road, the wounded lying untended as the passing foot soldiers stepped over them. A group of political prisoners in their striped pyjama uniforms were being employed to pull wagons full of possessions, suitcases, paintings and furniture, under the command of an SS unit. A red plane shot up the whole procession, sending the paintings in their gilded frames flying through the air and knocking down the prisoners along with the SS. The prisoners who survived ran or stumbled off into the trees towards the perimeter, some clutching the guns taken from the dead SS men. A house we passed had two elderly men strung up on nooses from its shutters, with a sign around their necks. We showed a white flag to the red monsters. The white flag itself was draped around the dead men's bodies, swaying in the breeze. A group of armed civilian women had cornered a Russian infantryman inside the corridor and were asking the passing troops what to do with the man. He stood, bareheaded and sullen, while his fate was discussed. Nobody was interested in him, and the women simply shot him through the head with a pistol, then climbed onto a passing wagon. A red fighter plane was hit by flak high overhead, and the aircraft smashed nose down into the trees, 
turning an ancient oak into a blazing torch as high as a church steeple. The pilot came down on a parachute and became entangled on branches across the road further on. He hung there, ten metres overhead, trying to free himself, the subject of disinterested glances from those trudging past, until somebody shot him through the body. Metre by metre, we began to leave this zone, entering an area where there were patches of long, narrow meadows shielded by fir trees. In some of these meadows, German aircraft had tried to land, perhaps escaping from the east and finishing their fuel here. One field had an abandoned Fokker wolf fighter, simply standing in the grass, its engine cowling steaming in the light. In another field, a Junkers 52 plane had crash-landed on its belly, and a man of general rank was kneeling on the ground nearby, retching into the grass. A few minutes later, beyond the trees, we saw shapes moving in another one of these lush pastures. I could see a glint of metal through the mist, and there was a smell of gasoline in the area. I dismounted from the panther and went forward with one of the infantrymen to see what was happening in there. I expected to see red tanks manoeuvring into position, or isolated elements of our armour in hiding, sitting out the surrounding battles. Instead, as we crept forwards between the trees, machine pistols in our hands, we saw a sight that few Germans were ever privileged to see. Through the mist, as the sun burned off the vapour, the glimpses of pale metal turned to a definite outline, which at first was blurred by the mist, but then became clear. In a few moments, as the metal object moved across the secluded pasture, both I and the infantryman with me drew breath and lowered our guns. The object was an aircraft of a design that we had seen in the newsreels and soldiers' magazines, presented to us as the greatest of its type, but surely none of us ever believed that we would see one in person. This was a Messerschmitt 262, the legendary jet-powered Schwalbe or Swan, the sleek and beautiful twin-engine creation that was one of our wonder weapons. I was astonished at how big it was in the newsreels. It seemed so much smaller, and I was astonished too at the crude nature of its construction. Its metal panels were evidently hammered by hand, and their metal skin was unpainted, except for the German cross on its fuselage, and the swastika on its tail fin. No propellers, one of the foot soldiers said to himself. Here is wonder, here's a miracle. The aircraft was balanced on its wheels, which were sinking into the lush turf. It was being dragged by a team of oxen, the simple wagon-pulling oxen that had been bred in this part of Germany for thousands of years. The oxen were roped together, and the rope was looped around the 262's undercarriage, and metre by metre those ancient beasts, guided by a farm boy of ten years of age, were dragging the jet plane through the grass towards the safety of the trees. We common soldiers stood mute at this sight. What did this mean for us, and for Germany? Our wonder weapons existed, they were there in front of our eyes, and they were superbly designed with the greatest science that humankind could summon. But the machine was crudely made, it was uneven, and it was being hauled like a medieval cart on its wheels by a gang of oxen, each animal trailing a cloud of flies from its arse. And it was leaking fuel, splashes of liquid were pouring from its hull, making the whole forest reek. Don't light a cigarette, my friends, or you're all finished. A Luftwaffe pilot squatted beside us, grinning. He was middle-aged, and he looked exhausted, with hollow cheeks and thin hair oiled over a balding skull. His flying boots were perfectly polished, but his moustache was yellow with nicotine. He gave us an account of how he had brought the plane down in an emergency landing on the pasture, leaking the precious jet fuel that was more valuable to the Reich than gold. But how shall I get to the West now? he murmured. Everything is lost. Perhaps I shall have a cigarette anyway when you are safely gone. We shook hands with him, eager to clasp the hand of a legend. Our complaints, our bitter jokes about the Luftwaffe were forgotten for a minute, as we watched the superb aircraft being pulled into the shadow of the elm trees, where it was to be stored, the pilot told us, until it could somehow be returned to service. As we left the thicket, the lowing of the oxen began, a sound that I recognised as the beasts of burden being unyoked from their load. 
A minute after that, the whole corner of the forest behind us was lit up, and we turned to see a colossal orange fireball climbing into the air above the trees. The fireball was dripping with burning fuel, rolling over as it rose, so hot that it burned the mist from the treetops for hundreds of metres around. The farm boy who had driven the oxen came running after us, shouting hysterically. He lit a cigarette, the fool, as if he wanted to die. Slowly these scenes and many others fell behind us, and the sounds of fighting from the perimeter became more distant. Our panzer creaked and rattled at walking pace through a smokescreen, our eyes streaming with tears which we had not shed in the battles, and entered a zone which appeared to be organised in some manner of discipline. Kettenhund men were directing the traffic onward, and the improvised defences and emplacements gave way to properly constructed ditches and trenches. The troops here were a mixture of the completely fresh and the exhausted, and the equipment likewise was both new and old. A number of immaculate Peike guns, their wheels barely muddy, were manned by gunners who resembled scarecrows, thin and ragged. A unit of Hitler youth troops, in clean uniforms and recent haircuts, were manning a defence point that consisted of an old Panzer III, with no wheels or tracks, standing in a mound of barbed wire. The troops were from a great variety of units and regiments, including armed police and Volkssturm men. Amazingly, there were field kitchens too, giving a ladleful of hot soup to anyone, soldier or civilian, who passed. I ate my ration on the panther's rear deck, leaning on the turret, surrounded by wounded men and children. The engine smoke coated us with grime, and the fumes made us nauseous, but we were properly inside the 12th Army sector, heading for the Elbe. As we rolled past a group of soldiers clustered around an armoured car, one of them turned to us and shouted something. I didn't catch it, but some of the children heard and began to tug my sleeve. Feldwebel? What is it, lad? The Führer is dead now. We stopped at the next group of troops and listened to their radio set for a few minutes. It announced that the Adolf Hitler had died in the fight for Berlin, only 30 kilometres to the north of us. The war continued all the same, in the hope of a final victory. Some women were weeping and some of the troops stood around talking openly of suicide. I felt little except for the pain in my back wound, for which I took the last of my drugs. The Twelfth Army sector around Brandenburg in front of the Elbe was a landscape of destruction and constant movement. The perimeter was being held by the remnants of the Twelfth and the escaped Ninth Armies, but the whole zone was being pressed heavily by the Reds except for the Elbe itself on the western boundary which faced the silent, unmoving Americans on their bank. Vast columns of vehicles and people were making their way across the rolling countryside towards the river. The Reds controlled the sky despite our flak, and their jabos came over frequently, strafing the columns, the buildings and the open land. We knew that if the Russians wanted to, they could bomb the sector into dust. They were holding back, waiting for the end of the war, and perhaps seeking to maximise their catch of humanity. Leaflets cascaded down from the sky, urging everyone in the sector to remain static and stop resisting the advance of the Red Army. Hitler is dead. Berlin has surrendered. The war has no logic and it must end now. In addition, voices spoke to us through loudspeakers amplified at incredibly high volume. These were the voices of Seydlitz officers, and the warm spring breeze carried them for kilometres across the landscape. The words were indistinct, but we caught surrender, peace, life, goodwill and a few others. We listened to this and the drone of the aircraft overhead as we joined a massive flood of people heading towards the river. It was rare now to see armed troops. Most had thrown away their weapons, and they walked with hands in their pockets or supporting their backpacks. Most epaulettes and other signs of rank had been removed from their uniforms, and the meadows were scattered with badges, caps and jackboots. Men's civilian clothing was prized now, and many men who wore the trousers and shirt of farm workers had the bearing of recent professional soldiers. Schnapps and other alcohol were in ample supply, and many people were to be seen lying drunk beside the road, 
desensitized to whatever they had witnessed and whatever fears possessed them. The fields and roadsides were lined with abandoned vehicles, both mechanized and horse-drawn. There were a few panzers among the trucks, kubelwagens and cars, but it seemed that most armoured vehicles had been left behind in the Kessel and the other battle zone. Our panther was the only one of its types that we saw, and it was close to dying under us. At a junction in the roads, a huge crater buried the way to Heavy Vehiclis and the foot traffic crossed on a wooden bridge. We tried to take the panther around this obstacle into the meadows, but the fields close to the river were marshy, and the tracks soon sank in deeply. There was no benefit in trying to make the machine go on any further. The river Elbe was within walking distance, the fuel was gone, and the engine was in danger of catching fire. We drove the old panzer further into the marshes, knowing this was the end, and not wanting the machine to fall into any other hands, either Russian, American, or even German. With the wounded and the civilians lifted off, we drove the panther in second gear for a few more metres, until it hit a stretch of water surrounded by bulrushes. It began to subside, the engine end going down first. We jumped clear and watched it sink. With fumes rising into the air, the front plate rose up, the long gun barrel dripping with marsh water. The cupola, from which I had seen so much and given so many orders in the heat of combat, filled up with the stagnant water and slid below the surface. There were some final bubbles and fumes. I stood there in silence as the green weeds gathered over the panther, and when the surface was still, I turned with my crew and we walked at the head of our small column along the choked roads down to the great river Elba. The approaches to the river were packed with people of all types, civilians, unarmed troops, and some combat troops who still carried their weapons. Among these were Waffen-SS men of the Panzer Corps, who were pushing through the crowds ahead of us, forcing the ranks of people out of their path. I could just see the river down at the foot of the slopes, over the heads of the thousands of people trying to make their way down there. The water looked black, and the river was about 200 metres wide. There was a single bridge at this point spanning the width, the other bridges to north and south having been destroyed in April to prevent the Americans crossing. This bridge was a narrow, wood and steel construction, and as we came onto the slopey, I saw the reason for the so many people still waiting to cross over, the bridge was blown up in its central point, and only a single file of people could walk across to the American side, one at a time. The American bank looked largely deserted. There were no panzers or gun emplacements there, and no American infantry that I could see. I spoke to a lieutenant of an artillery unit beside me in the crowd, and he told me that the Americans had pulled their men back several kilometres to the west of the river. They don't want a conflict with the Russians he said with a shrug. But look at all these people. There must be fifty or sixty thousand people here. Will the Amis let all of us cross over to them? I squinted down at the opposite bank. The line of people who had already crossed over the damaged bridge were simply fanning out across the grassland on that side, trudging off to the west. There was a huge pile of discarded small arms over their carbines, rifles and machine guns, helmets and panzerfausts, indicating that the troops saw no need of them when on the American side. I saw some men trying to swim the river against the swollen and fast-flowing current. Some emerged on the American bank, but many seemed to disappear under the dark water and not resurface. Someone had tried to make a boat out of a bridging pontoon, but this sank slowly as its crew paddled across and the men slipped away under the water. Ahead of us, the SS men were beating a path through the crowds in their rush to reach the riverbank. Shots were fired, and in a minute, we stepped over the bodies of two artillery cadets who had evidently sought to argue with the SS. There were other bodies lying neglected on the ground, wounded men and civilians who had succumbed, and those in their final throes who had nobody to assist them. Lost children wandered through the thousands of adults crying out for their relatives. The civilians in my column gathered up half a dozen of these children, and we remained together as we shuffled slowly forward to the bridge. On the approaches, there were troops guarding the bridge itself, 
who sought to extort valuables from those people waiting to cross in return for jumping forward in the crowds. For a gold watch, a good camera, or a diamond ring, you could go directly to the bridge itself without waiting. At first the people cursed these troops, but the sound of a bombardment from behind us, up on the slopes above the river, and the screams of the wounded from those explosions, brought many offers of payment. The crowd was swaying, and people were falling underfoot and being trampled. From somewhere, a horse bolted through the crowd, kicking and trampling anyone who got in its path until it was felled with shots. When a red aircraft flew low overhead, not firing but low enough for us to smell the vapour of its exhausts, the crowd panicked and tried to storm the entrance to the bridge itself. Many people were crushed or trodden to death here, and inevitably it was the frailest and weakest who suffered the most. The banks of the river were steep clay cliffs, and many civilians fell into the water and did not resurface. In all this chaos, the remnants of my column clambered finally onto the bridge, and we began to walk across the planks in single file, with the water twenty metres below us, squeezing past the damaged section in the centre. Setting foot on the opposite bank was a strange experience. During everything we had seen and done in our breakout from the Kessel, the thought of the American side of the Elbe had been constantly in our minds. Now that we trod on the grass, without one single American soldier, panzer or American plane in sight, the sensation was unreal, as if my feet were numb. With my crew and the fragments of infantry and civilians still with us, we left our pistols and other weapons on the pile of sidearms, a pyramid of gunmetal which rose to a height of four metres. All I kept was the photo in my pocket and the capo's iron cross on its ribbon, snatched from his body in the sunken road. As we turned to leave, a kettenhund came staggering towards us. This man was drunk and waving a pistol at us. Our civilians shrunk away from him while he gestured with the pistol at the medal in my hand. I'll take that, he said, with a reek of schnapps. You didn't earn it, I said. The American boys pay me ten bucks for an iron cross, he laughed. He used the American word bucks, not dollars, as if he was now one of them. I'll give you two bucks for yours now so you can get a meal and a shave. Just as I hit him in the face, he shot me. That was the way my war ended in May 1945, on the west bank of the Elbe under American occupation, but without an American in sight. After my two years of fighting, after Kursk and the retreat to the west, after the Halbe Kessel and the fields full of bodies, after everything I was ashamed of and everything that I took pride in, my war ended with a drunken Kettenhund shooting a hole in my shoulder blade. As I lay on the west bank of the Elbe, watching the boots of my panther crew as they kicked the Kettenhund man to death right there and then, I could only close my eyes against the sky and accept that everything that we had done was now at an end. My crew took me to a Red Cross centre in the American zone, an improvised hospital in an abandoned school building on the outskirts of Hanover. My injury was extensive, and added to the existing wound in my back, recovery was slow. I spent days in the grounds of the school building listening to American radio shows and playing cards. At first, the food that we were given was so rich and sweet that it made me vomit, as my stomach was accustomed to Wehrmacht rations and water. We German men would stand at the table at mealtimes and shake our heads in wonder at the sight of the hot dogs, scrambled eggs and bread rolls, the biscuits and Hershey bars we could buy from the store. The nurses were Red Cross volunteers and nuns of various countries, who could not be bettered anywhere for the care they gave us. My uniform was folded in a locker, and I took to wearing old civilian trousers and shirt which came from the hospital clothing bank. I shaved every day and smoked cigarettes in the sunshine. The patients did not speak to each other about their experiences in the war. Once I saw a new patient brought in, who had been injured in a knife fight. I thought I recognised him as one of the SS men from the bridge crossing. But I said nothing about this, and neither did he. My Panther crew were dispersed to prisoner processing camps in the American and British sectors, and I heard that the civilians that had been in our column simply disappeared into the landscape of Germany. 
I was interrogated by an American sergeant who wanted only to know if I was a member of the National Socialists. He was less interested in my war record. There were simply so many of us to be processed. May 1945 turned to June and then July. Now the wisdom of surrendering to the Americans was confirmed absolutely in my mind because everybody knew that the information we had about our prisoners in the East was zero, literally zero. The millions of men who had surrendered to the Reds east of the Elbe had melted into the Soviet system, and nothing was known of them. Some people said that they were in the central Soviet republics, places that lay beyond the Caucasus Mountains, and now might just as well be on the moon. Other people said that they were in Siberia or Mongolia, from where the Hiwis and Red prisoners had always told us not even Russians can ever return. We in the West felt vindicated in our determination to escape that fate, while many of us also felt uneasy, knowing that luck had played a large part in our diet of hot dogs and chocolate. At the same time, the future of the western part of Germany was becoming clearer. The western alleys were investing in rebuilding the cities they had destroyed. Anything could be bought for a price. Coffee, cosmetics, guns, gasoline. Morphine, colour magazines, cameras, bourbon. I was offered a jeep if I could scrape together ten iron crosses plus Luger pistols to go with them. They got to be Lugers, my American contact insisted. Walters won't do it. The streets were full of German girls walking with American GIs and glum German boys watching them pass. The atmosphere in the streets, strangely, felt like some time before the war when the future seemed full of possibilities. My future, though, was uncertain. My only remaining family had been the Wehrmacht, and I had no home, no occupation, and no resources. At night, the hospital ward was full of weeping and cries as the men dreamed of their battles. Some nights, I did not let myself sleep, knowing I would see the Halbe Kessel again, and above all the dead Russian man in the cellar, whose friend gave his steel helmet to the German child. Why did that one Russian visit me at night, after all the scores that I had killed, the thousands that I had seen killed? Because I showed him the photo of the girl in my pocket was that why? I lay on the bed, in my own personal kessel of the mind, wondering about all this. I knew the time was approaching for me to leave the hospital. One by one, the wounded German men that were in the hospital were able to leave, and most were discharged into the civilian population. The nurses saw that I was troubled by this, and they didn't understand why. But you have your sister, one nurse said to me after changing the dressing over my shoulder wound for the last time as we watched humid rain on the windows of the ward late one afternoon. Or is she actually your girlfriend, the photo that you keep? I didn't answer. What is her name, Wolfgang? You have never told us her name. The photo was in a frame on my locker. I made the frame myself from pieces of a medical box and fitted a glass over it from a piece that I found in the gardens. I looked at that photo each day, remembering the girl's mother and the way that she died on the rear deck of my panther in the Kessel. To be frank, I had started to imagine a new life with that girl and the remnants of whatever family she had to replace the complete absence of family in my life outside the Panzer troops. If I must be honest, I had spent my time in the hospital imagining my future life with that girl, and a house that we might have in the American sector, and me finding a paying job, maybe working with machines. Any solitary man knows the kind of thoughts that I had. What is her name, Wolfgang? I had no idea of her name, but there was an address on the back of the photo, in a town not far from the Elbe, and the more I thought about that girl, the more I thought that I should go and visit her. And so it was, at the beginning of August 1945, that I left the hospital in a civilian suit and tie, with a backpack and a small bunch of flowers that the nurses made for me, because they knew where I was going and why. I found a lift on a postal truck, and then a farm cart, both driven by men my age, who must surely have been in the war. We didn't ask each other for details, watching the streets full of people at work, clearing the mounds of rubble and putting their homes back together for the future. 
People stood in lines, passing bricks from hand to hand, while American bulldozers cleared whole blocks and American trucks brought in whole loads of timber and concrete to build everything again. Had the Americans forgiven us then? It seemed that they had, and it felt to me that the Halber Kessel was now in the distant past, and that its secrets would be locked for all time in the forests east of the Elbe, and in the minds of those who had witnessed those events. America was our future now, America, where anything could be forgiven, forgotten, and lost. As the cart halted outside the address, I felt that this was my future too. This new world of building and forgetting the past. The house was shuttered and the doors were locked. My heart was pounding with apprehension, as it used to do before combat. Getting no answer from the silent house, I asked a neighbour if they knew of the girl, showing the photo in its frame. The old lady took me into her own house next door and sat me at a table in a darkened kitchen. Is she still living there? I asked. Where is she? The neighbour woman wrung a cloth in her hands. The Americans have been very good to us, she said. Yes, yes, I see that. But this young lady? The Americans have been generous and have restored order. We are very lucky here compared to those in the East under the Reds. What the women have suffered over there, it is indescribable. Yes, we are lucky. I myself made great efforts to reach the West, to escape the Reds, I told her. Now I see that the journey was worthwhile. But this girl, where is she? We have no complaints against the Americans, young man. It is to be expected that in any army there will be one or two bad apples, a small number of problem soldiers. I am sorry, young man, but the girl in your photo is no longer with us. She has left? She is dead. It is very regrettable. In any army there will be one or two who do not obey the law. We are lucky that the Americans have so few of these compared to the Russians. You must not be angry, and you must not look for revenge, please. The fact is that the young lady was killed by an American soldier some weeks ago. If you must know the details, he was drunk and forced himself on her, and then he strangled her. But the law has been applied, you see. The man himself is in their military prison, and it is said that he will be hanged for the crime. Our mayor is very close to the Americans, and he says that the man will surely be hanged. But such events are rare. They are almost unheard of in the American sector, as you can imagine. We must all try to forget this event now, because it is not good to remember these things for long. I nodded in the darkened kitchen, listening to the sounds of the reconstruction outside. I walked away from the house in the sunset through the summer fields, not knowing where I was going next. In these meadows there were junkyards of armoured vehicles, where long rows of our panzers were lined up in the grass, rusting, abandoned and silent. The little hetzers, the stugs, the great tigers, the great panthers, all waiting in the sunset, empty, row upon row, leaking oil, with birds making nests in their turrets. It seems that when a war ends, there is too much metal left over, too much steel, and all the panzers lose their value. Truly, the neighbour lady was correct. It is not good to remember these things for long.